Madam Welcome. Chair. Thank you for coming. And you're going to tell us about debt capacity <laughs> and how much we can possibly have, right? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Jennifer Hassamer. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at Minnesota Management and Budget. So yes, we will be uh, shifting gears here this morning and moving away from this wonderful summary of all these projects that the state has invested in the past and getting a little more technical. Uh, in your materials, you should have two pieces of information. The first is just a copy of our latest debt capacity forecast, about a seven-page document. That is for your reading pleasure. I will be referring to some of the information in there today, um, but also then just referring to the slides that hopefully you have a copy of in your materials. <coughs> so first of all, I thought I would start <coughs> by talking about the state's capital investment guidelines. And as a general matter, why even have guidelines? Um, they can communicate policy goals and help decision makers make decisions and the important work before this committee. And they can demonstrate a long-term commitment to capital funding for the state's important needs. Why our specific guidelines, which I will walk through in more detail in the next few slides. But our guidelines are in line with how all of the rating agencies have looked at the state's debt portfolio and rate the state's bonds. They are inclusive of all of the state debt obligations that are outstanding. And they represent the state's strong financial management. So guidelines are most effective when they are comprehensive and uh, include both current and proposed debt and all types of debt that an issuer might issue. When they have caps, so they set limits and targets that are adhered to, and when they are communicated so that decision makers and policy makers uh, understand them and have the information that they need. Turning to slide three, I'll just walk through each of the guidelines in turn here. The first guideline uh, looks at state outstanding debt um, that is supported by the general fund. And these are the bonds that the state has sold. And there is a limit that those shall not exceed 3.25% of state personal income. When we published our November debt capacity forecast, you can see that current outstanding debt represented only 2.41% of state personal income. The types of debt that are included in guideline number one are state issued debt, which includes state general obligation bonds, both our various purpose bonds and our trunk highway bonds, as well as state appropriation bonds supported by the general fund. It also includes state supported debt. So this includes debt issued by the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, where debt service is supported by a standing appropriation out of the general fund and also lease purchase financings for real estate. And an example of this includes the St. Paul Port Authority bonds for the Anderson and Freeman buildings. One type of debt that is not picked up in our guidelines is what is called uh, self-supporting debt. And this includes, uh, for example, revenue bonds, where the bonds are paid back by a dedicated revenue stream and not paid back out of the state general fund. Turning to the next slide, our second capital investment guideline uh, broadens the measure of debt that we are looking at uh, to include all authorized debt. Um, so that is debt that has both been sold and debt that is authorized but not yet sold. Um, it includes all of the debt that I mentioned for guideline number one and also layers in uh, state uh, moral obligations uh, issued by the State Housing Finance Agency and the Office of Higher Education and as well as lease purchase financings for equipment such as our master lease program. Um, the limit in guideline number two is that all of these obligations shall not exceed 6% of state personal income. And you can see we are well below that at only 3.82% of state personal income. Turning this slide to the next slide, our final capital investment guideline uh, states that at least 40% of state general obligation bonds are, shall mature within five years and 70% shall mature within 10 years. And currently our outstanding general obligation bonds, we have more than 73% that are scheduled to mature within the next 10 years. And I'll mention here briefly that the constitution does limit the maximum term of general obligation bonds to 20 years. The, uh, the importance of this guideline is that it helps uh, the cost of bonding bills be realized more quickly, which helps ensure that in the future there is fiscal capacity to continue with our ongoing financing of capital investments. 
Turning the page to the next slide, this is a table that we publish in our debt capacity forecast, and I thought I would just take a minute to orient you to this, because this is actually a good snapshot of the state's debt portfolio um, and how we calculate and measure against our guidelines. First of all, the first column of numbers represents all of the principal that we have outstanding. So these are the bonds that we have sold, broken down into the various categories. And you can see that summed up at the bottom, a number that I've circled for you, we currently have $7.8 billion of outstanding net tax supported debt. The next column over shows what amounts have been authorized by the legislature, but that the state has not yet sold. And currently there is about $2.85 billion of authorized but unissued debt. And then the final column totals everything. And if you go all the way to the bottom where it layers in the state moral obligations and equipment leases, you can see what is being picked up in guideline number two, all of the authorized debt. And that is currently about $12.4 billion. At the very bottom of the, the table here, we just show again the calculations, how we are measuring the percentages in the first two guidelines um, against the state personal income that I've circled for you as well. Approximately 80% of the state's debt portfolio is general obligation bonds, about $6.3 billion outstanding right now, with the other 20% representing the state appropriation debt, about $1.5 billion. Um, and there is about, as I mentioned before, 12.7, 12.8 billion that is authorized but unissued. Turning to the next slide, uh, these guidelines, when we publish them in our debt capacity forecast, which we do publish twice a year in November and February in conjunction with the budget and economic forecast, they reflect a point in time calculation of the state's debt portfolio. Um, once the legislature authorizes new bonding, those bonds will first show up in guideline number two. And then once MMB issues those bonds or another agency um, issues those bonds, they will also appear in guideline number one. Um, you may be interested to know that when bonds are authorized in a bonding bill, the state does not sell those bonds all at once. Um, we sell those bonds on a cash flow basis. Uh, we work with the state agencies to understand what their financing and cash flow needs are basically for a 12 month period. So when we sell bonds, we're, we're trying to cash flow the projects for the next year. Turning to debt capacity then, what debt capacity tries to get at is how big could a bonding bill be? Um, you, you may know that in the budget forecast, we do forecast future capital investment bills based on a historic 10-year rolling average. Uh, when we published our November debt capacity forecast, we updated the 10-year average. So now the forecast is assuming that there will be a $265 million bonding bill uh, this session and in future odd numbered sessions, and then $755 million in an even-year session. <coughs> And turning to the next slide, which also tries to get at how big a bonding bill could be, this is a table that we include in the debt capacity forecast, and it's worth explaining. Um, this attempts to show what the maximum bonding bill could be that could be authorized by the legislature this year. I'll caveat that, that this is in no way intended to be a recommendation in terms of a target that the legislature should be um, looking at. Um, but what our goal was in producing this table was to maximize the first possible opportunity that the state would reach the limit in either guideline number one or guideline number two. Um, you will see on the second line of this table that under our existing capital investment guidelines, the legislature could authorize almost $3.5 billion in new uh, debt this session. And that would have the impact of reaching guideline number one in fiscal year 22. Um, I will caveat that that, again, is not a, a recommendation to the legislature. It is merely showing where we fall within existing guidelines. Um, and the, the other line to focus on is the bottom line in the table, what the impact to the general fund would be based on the maximum amounts reflected in that second line. And I will also add that the, those maximum new debt authorization numbers could be split among any of the different bonding sources that are picked up in our guidelines. So general obligation bonds, trunk highway bonds, state appropriation bonds, and various real estate financings, including certificates of participation. So that is what I had for you today, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Those are really... Good numbers. <laughs> <laughs>
3.475 billion dollars on line two there. But then that <coughs> brings down to the bottom line, like you said, goes down to zero then. And this is 2019, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you wanted to, the point you wanted to make. So maybe we shouldn't think as high as 3.475. Just, just doodling something here, committee members. But. Two hundred and sixty five million is so dinky compared to three, four, <laughs> seven, five. <laughs> we'll have to have conversations about this, I think. Um, the question hands up. Representative Wogamot. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hasmer, are you able to provide any context to us uh, where our bonding practices and debt capacity, how that relates to the bonding practices and debt capacities of other states in our region and perhaps other states in our country with similar population and demographic makeups of that of our state. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, that, that is a very detailed question. Um, every state is different in terms of what their constitution permits in terms of borrowing authority and capacity. So it does, it can make comparisons across states difficult, even with similar demographic profiles. Um, but that being said, um, some of the rating agencies do publish reports that try to at least standardize some information across states. Um, and certainly if you're interested, we could pull some of that together and provide it to you. Thank you, Ms. Hasmer. That'd be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And when you provide it, perhaps we'll need an explanation of it, too, at that time. Okay. Okay. Representative Considine. Dine. Representative Thank you, Constantine. Chair Murphy. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Um, we are still at a triple A bond rating for the state, though, because we have done this so responsibly in the past. Is that correct? Madam Chair Representative, yes, that is correct. And I would be remiss if I did not point out for this committee that the state did earn back a second triple A rating just last summer. So the state currently maintains two triple A ratings that we are very proud of. Follow-up question, Chair Murphy? Representative Constantine, go ahead. And that triple A rating saves us tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars every year um, in interest charges? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, that is true. A triple A rating uh, tr translates into the lowest borrowing costs possible for the state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 